Okay, so we've seen now kind of how these new classical economists define the business cycle as these fluctuations around the trend. And we see how this is maybe different than how people traditionally thought about business cycles as being just these recessions and depressions. Um, and also how it might differ from how you or I might think about the business cycle, perhaps in the same way that people used to. But what's the point? So, okay, fine. So now we have this definition of the business cycle, but what do we do with it? Well, the intention of Hodrick and Prescott when they wrote this paper was to document statistics related to the business cycle. And they wanted to do that because they had these new theories of the business cycle, these new classical theories, which were emerging, and they wanted to define sort of how they might be good theories. And the way to make them good theories, they said, was to make them consistent with these facts that they documented. So a good theory would be one that could approximate these statistics that they document. And so here's a quote from their paper. They say, the thesis of this paper is that the search for an equilibrium model of the business cycle, so that's this project that new classical economists had initiated, where they now had these new theories of the business cycle. So the search for an equilibrium model of the business cycle is only beginning and studying the co-movements of aggregate economic variables will provide insights into the features of the economy that an equilibrium theory should incorporate. So it's really this sort of data finding exercise that would then be used to sort of improve these, these equilibrium models of the economy that the new classical economists were building. That was the point. And so in particular, we're going to look at three kinds of statistics that Hodrick and Prescott talked about and that are documented in your textbook. So those are co-movement, so that's the correlation of variables with GDP over the business cycle. So put another way, when one variable, or that is when GDP is high relative to its trend, does that mean that another variable, say consumption, is also high relative to its trend? Does it mean that it's low relative to its trend? And so on. Variability, so how large is the variance of variables over the business cycle? So put another way, if you plotted these deviations from trend, do they deviate a lot from the trend? Are there big fluctuations relative to the trend or are there small fluctuations? Does GDP, for example, does it only deviate about 5% from its trend or does it deviate 50% from its trend? These are the kinds of questions variability looks at. And lead lag. So do changes in a variable happen before changes in GDP? Do they happen after changes in GDP? Do they happen at the same time? And this is the lead lag relationship. So co-movement, as I said, is really just about this positive or negative correlation between GDP and another variable. So if we took their deviations from trend, applied them as percentage deviations from trend, so that they're in the same units. Does the other variable tend to be high when GDP is high and low when GDP is low? Or vice versa, does the other variable tend to be low when GDP is high? Say unemployment, you would imagine that unemployment is low when GDP is high, and vice versa, when GDP is low, unemployment is high. So this is what we mean by this positive and negative correlation. So this is one way we could see it by looking at the time series of percentage deviations from trend. The other way would be to look at scatter plots. So here each point represents a given, say, year. So this would be, let's say, year 2000. And let's say we're looking at the correlation between imports and GDP. So this would say in 2000, was GDP on the x-axis high and imports were also high? And likewise in, say, 1995, if GDP was low, did imports tend to be low? So if you plot these as a scatter plot and you can draw a positively sloping line through them, then we say that there's a positive correlation between x and y. So really it's just saying what we said before. When one is high, is the other high? And when one is low, is the other low? And likewise, if your scatter plot 
you can draw a line through it, a line of best fit or an OLS line for those of you who have taken Eco 220. If that line is negatively sloped, then we'd say that there's a negative correlation between Y and X. Or likewise, you can imagine that there's no correlation. So there's no relationship at all between movements in GDP and this other variable. And in that case, we say there's zero correlation between Y and X. Now, we also have sort of different terms of talking about this. So one way is to talk about positive and negative correlations, but the other set of terms are as follows. When uh, deviations from trend are positively correlated with GDP, we say that that variable is pro-cyclical. So that is, it follows the cycle of GDP. It's pro-cyclical. When the deviations from trend are negatively correlated with GDP, we refer to this as counter-cyclical. It moves counter to the GDP cycle, counter-cyclical. And if there's no correlation between the two, we say acyclical, i.e. it doesn't follow the cycle at all. And so here's an example. This is imports and GDP. So as I said here, we plot the percentage deviations from trend for each. So we calculate the trend, we take the deviations from trend, and then we express these as percentages. And then we plot the series over time. And we can see here that generally, when GDP is high, so are imports relative to their respective trends. When GDP is low relative to its trend, so are imports low relative to their trend. And so in this sense, we can see that just looking at this series that Imports are pro-cyclical. They tend to move with the cycle. Put another way, when things are good, we tend to buy a lot, and especially from abroad. We tend to buy a lot of stuff from abroad. We tend to import a lot. And likewise, like I said, you can plot this as a scatter plot, and that's done here. And you can see that if we were to draw a line of best fit, it would be positively sloped. And so that suggests, again, that the two are positively correlated or that imports are pro-cyclical. What about variability? <clears throat> well, for those of you who have taken ECO 220, this should all be standard. And for those who aren't, I'll quickly say that one way that we talk about variability, so how much a variable kind of varies over the cycle or over time or across observations is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is given here. And you can see that essentially it's going to be higher when x bar is the mean of the series. The standard deviation will be higher when this difference is large for observations. So in other words, it will be higher when on average variables are far away from their mean. Then we'll have a higher standard deviation. And in particular, when we're doing this business cycle analysis, we usually measure variability relative to the variability of GDP. So we'll look at a variable and we'll say, we'll calculate its standard deviation and we'll see how it compares to the standard deviation of GDP. So for example, if a variable is 50% as variable as GDP, that is its standard deviation is 50% the standard deviation of GDP, that means that over the cycle, it tends to move less than does GDP. And vice versa, if the variable is, say, 500% as variable as GDP, then that means that over the cycle, it moves way more than GDP does. Its fluctuations or this wave-like pattern is way larger than for GDP. So finally, what about lead lag? <clears throat> so you can see here from these pictures, A leading variable is one who tends to change before GDP. So its movements anticipate movements in GDP. And conversely, a lagging variable is one that can be anticipated by changes in GDP. So its changes happen after changes in GDP. Or another way of looking at this is to look at the turning points of the peaks and troughs. So remember I said, a peak is sort of the top of the cycle and the trough is the bottom. And a turning point really just means when we stop going from decreasing to increasing. 
<clears throat> and so if these peaks of the variable or the troughs of the variable precede those of GDP, well, then we can see that it's probably a leading variable. And vice versa, if its peaks and troughs come after the peaks and troughs of GDP, well, then it's a lagging variable. And so here's one example of a variable, uh, perhaps a rare one, that is a leading variable. It leads GDP. That is, its movements anticipate those of GDP. Its movements happen before those of GDP. And so, as I said, one way we can look at this is by looking at the turning points relative to those of GDP. So look right here. This turning point in stock prices happens before the turning point in GDP. Likewise, you could think of here, we have a turning point in stock prices that precedes the one in GDP, or here, or perhaps, hmm, well, anyways, there are several uh, examples for you. <clears throat> but again, the idea here is that generally changes in stock prices, when we measure them as deviations from their trend, tend to precede changes in GDP. Again, when we measure that variable by deviations from its trend. So now with these in hand, let's kind of apply these to some typical macro variables, okay? So what about consumption? Well, here's our plot of percentage deviation from trend of consumption and of GDP. So first, obviously, consumption is pro-cyclical. And this makes sense, right? Generally, when things are good, when times are good, we have more income, we consume more. And so you can see that here, you can see that when GDP is high, consumption is high, and when GDP is low, consumption is low. And so the two series kind of tend to move together. And another way of seeing it is that the correlation coefficient is 0.78, which is positive and close to one. For those of you who haven't taken ECO 220 yet, this correlation coefficient varies between negative one and one. So a correlation coefficient of one means perfectly positively correlated, i.e. the two series are exactly the same and they're positively correlated. <clears throat> negative one will be perfectly negatively correlated and a correlation coefficient of zero would be no correlation at all. So here we have a highly uh, or a fairly high and positive correlation coefficient, which suggests that it is pro-cyclical, as we can see from this graph. Variability, well, consumption is less volatile than GDP. So its variability is about 83% of GDP. So again, this just means that over the cycle, it moves less than does GDP. And you can kind of see this. You can see that in these troughs, look, consumption falls less than does GDP. In this peak, consumption goes up less than does GDP, likewise in this trough here. And so, again, just looking at the graph here, we can see that the variability is less than that of GDP. But also, we can calculate it if we take the standard deviation of each and compare. And in terms of lead lag, we say that they're coincident because, really, one doesn't lead the other. Consumption doesn't generally change before GDP nor do changes in consumption follow changes in GDP. Generally, the two happen at the same time, and so we say that it's coincident. What about investment? So here, investment is the red series, GDP is the blue series. And so again, we can see that investment is pro-cyclical, right? When GDP is high relative to its trend, so is investment. And again, we can calculate the correlation coefficient, about 0.81, which confirms that it is pro-cyclical. Variability is 509% of GDP. So the standard deviation of investment over this time period is about five times that of GDP. And again, you can see this from the graph. I mean, look at how much more investment varies over the cycle, these huge swings relative to the smaller ones we see for GDP. And finally, lead lag, again, the two variables are essentially coincident. Uh, in general, turning points of one don't protect or don't anticipate turning points of the other. Generally, they happen at the same time. What about employment? Well, again, no one should be surprised here that, as you can see here, 
they are pro-cyclical or employment is pro-cyclical. So generally when GDP is high relative to trend, so is employment. When things are good, when the economy is booming, there are lots of jobs. This shouldn't be terribly surprising. And again, it's confirmed by this positive and high correlation coefficient of 0.79. It is less variable than GDP. So it's about 80% as variable as GDP. Its standard deviation is 80%, that of GDP over the series. And your textbook says it's lagging. I guess I can kind of see this, but you know, maybe uh, employment bottoms out a little bit later than GDP here. But if it's lagging, it's not lagging by very much. And so I put lagging with a question mark. What about inflation? So here I say inflation and I also call it the Phillips curve. And the reason is the Phillips curve was named after A.W. Phillips, who I believe was an Australian economist who suggested that there's a negative relationship between the growth in nominal wages and unemployment. So put simply, he said, when unemployment is low, wages grow a lot faster than when unemployment is high. When unemployment is high, there's not a lot of pressure on wages. Wages don't tend to grow a lot. And really now it's come to mean the following relationship. So now when people talk about the Phillips curve, generally what they talk about is this correlation between changes in GDP and inflation. So now we've kind of, we're not focusing on unemployment and wages, now we're focusing on economic activity in general, GDP, and changes in prices in general, and in inflation. And so the hypothesis here, the Phillips curve hypothesis, is that when GDP is high relative to its trend, when we're in a boom, it should put pressure on aggregate prices and inflation should be high. And conversely, when GDP is low relative to its trend, when we're in a bust, when things aren't so great, there will be very low pressure on aggregate prices and so inflation will be low. And so we can look at that then. Is that true? Is there a positive correlation between inflation and GDP? And so you can see here that there is some correlation for sure. In fact, there's a correlation coefficient of 0.4. So there isn't as strong of a correlation as say between GDP and employment, but it's still there. And you can kind of confirm that here, right? I mean, here's a period where inflation was high and likewise GDP was high relative to trend and vice versa in these later time periods. And the two are essentially coincident. If we plot them as a scatter plot, you can see why we're getting a lower correlation coefficient. We don't have as tight of a relationship as we did for other variables. You can see that, you know, if we drew a line through these, there are many points that aren't that close to the line. It's not a very close correlation. And so the textbook kind of asks, and many people have asked, does this mean that the Phillips curve isn't real? Is there not really this relationship between aggregate economic activity, between GDP and, and inflation? And so, as I say here, in fact, there's been some debate about what's going on with the Phillips curve, especially recently. And there's some question about whether it's flattening. So when I say if flattening, I mean, does that mean that changes in GDP or changes in aggregate economic activity have smaller effects on inflation these days. And so for example, and one of the reasons this question has come up is that up until very recently, certainly not today, but until very recently, we had incredibly low US unemployment. And yet inflation was also very low. If we accepted the Phillips curve hypothesis, we would have expected that because unemployment was so low, we should also have really high inflation, but we didn't. So what's going on? Well, there's a few possible causes and I stress here that I'm not gonna test you on these causes, but for those of you who are interested, here's but a few, because I do think this is interesting and very pertinent. I mean, it's a puzzle that uh, is very important today and that economists don't necessarily know the answer to. So one hypothesis is that the central bank has just been really effective at convincing people that inflation will stay low and constant. 
So because they've been so good at inflation targeting, people think, oh, okay, well, the economy is booming today and there's pressure on my prices, but why bother raising them? I know that the central bank's going to step in and, and bring us back to a, a sort of lower uh, inflationary time. So that's one hypothesis. A paper I was reading just recently suggests that it's simply just that prices aren't responding to cost pressures in the way they used to. So they say, yeah, when, when the economy is doing well, there's all kinds of pressure on wages and on input prices. But me, as a producer of final goods, I'm not passing those costs onto, my, onto final consumers. I'm not adjusting my prices to take account of these cost pressures in the way that businesses used to. And the other kind of common explanation is that we're just not measuring things right. So for example, in answer to the question, why is US unemployment so low, but inflation is also low, people have said, well, the problem is we're just not measuring unemployment right. Unemployment is low, but that includes a lot of people who are working part-time but don't want to be working part-time, or who are working in the gig economy and don't want to be working in the gig economy, etc. And so they suggest that we're just not measuring things right. It's not that the Phillips curve is broken down. You just don't have a good measure of aggregate economic activity or of unemployment. Finally, the last thing we're going to look at is labor productivity. And so here I have ALP, average labor, uh, average labor productivity, which is just defined as GDP over the number of workers in the economy. So you can see how many people are employed or you can also measure it by number of hours of employment. <clears throat> and you can see GDP. If you divide one by the other, then that's average labor productivity. And you can see that it varies with the cycle. It is, in fact, pro-cyclical. It has a pretty high correlation coefficient of 0.66. So when average labor productivity is high, so is GDP. And when GDP is low, so is average labor productivity. And it's slightly less variable, but still. Now, oh, and it's coincident, of course. So what's the significance with this one? I mean, why am I showing you average labor productivity? Well, there is some real significance to this when we're talking about this new classical theory and about new classical economics, which is that new classical business cycle theories are based on changes in productivity. So in other words, these theories see business cycles as being the response to shocks in productivity. So when I said that they're looking at uh, the business cycle as being an equilibrium phenomenon, you'll see this later, what they're talking about is that there are some random shocks to productivity in the economy. We don't necessarily know what they are, but these shocks to productivity happen. <coughs> And when productivity is high, there's a positive shock. It leads me to, say, employ more people, to increase my wages, and so on. And then people respond rationally to these shocks. And this is what's causing these ups and downs in the economy. So we have booms when there are positive productivity shocks, and we have busts when there are negative productivity shocks. And that would also explain this correlation we see here. And so, as I say, you'll see these models in chapter 13. So be patient, but you're getting there. And I did just want to tell you kind of the significance of this variable to what you'll be seeing. <clears throat>